Welcome and aloha. I am Mark Schlav, the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Today we're going to talk with Wes Porter, an attorney who came across the sea to Hawaii. Wes is a magistrate judge for the U.S. District Court for the District of Hawaii. He's also a passionate teacher and coach of life and legal skills for his students, especially young people. And that is what I have asked Wes to discuss with us today. So welcome, Wes. How are Thank you? you? Good, to having good, me. good to see you. Thank you for being here. First, I, I just want to ask you a couple personal questions. How, how did you get to Hawaii? And why did you get to Hawaii? What, what's that about? Sure. I was, uh, I was uh, a Navy JAG. So I, uh, after law school, went into the Navy as a judge advocate general or a JAG officer. And I was fortunate enough to be stationed out here at, at Pearl Harbor, what they call trial, trial service office specific at that time. So uh, I, I quite literally made my way across the sea. I actually uh, took a naval ship to come out here for the first time. And uh, it, it was the start of my legal career. Um, uh, here, here in uh, Oahu. Okay, and and now you're a U.S. magistrate judge, but I I know that you are very passionate about teaching and coaching, and those are terms that are kind of interchangeable in a way. Uh, it's not coaching sports teams necessarily, but it's coaching students, right? And and what what do those terms mean to you? Yeah, I think I think by whatever label, uh, you know, we're really talking about. Uh, connecting with people that are open to learning. And, and as you suggested, for me, it's the focus is on young people to 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 see uh, where their curiosities lie, if I can be of help, if it overlaps with something that that I might have some knowledge in, some proficiency and some expertise in, if I can share, and a lot of it, I, I think of coaching as sort of skill building more than just information transfer, you know, uh, I think when a lot of us think back on our schooling and who's teaching us and who's coaching us, they have information. They're up on a stage. They're giving it to us. We're sitting there with notepad, taking it down and receiving the information from them. And uh, that made sense by the availability of information back in the day when most of us went to school. And nowadays, because we all have a supercomputer, uh, you know, in our right pocket uh, or, or right next to us at within arm's length. Now it's more, you know, what skills can you can you train folks to have such that they can marshal that infinite amount of information and, and use it uh, to better their path. Okay, so you're you're trying to make the road to learning a little bit easier than it was maybe when, at least when I was going to school. Uh, and what what are your personal experiences about teaching and scholastic coaching? What, what have you done? What are you doing now? So my, my personal experience is I think, you know, I had some of the same uh, educational uh, uh, rigor that everyone else had where I went from class to class and had it force fed to me and had to spit it out on a one-time exam and kind of uh, made my way grade to grade and school to school and uh, in the traditional way. And then I think especially as it related to a couple of different experience, one within athletics and the other, you know, was in law school when I started getting to the sort of skills training part of my education. When someone was teaching me how to do something or giving me uh, the tools to sort of take on board a skill that, that I would have with me the rest of my career, the rest of my life, um, you know, sort of how to approach something, how to, uh, how to go about uh, you know, handling something, whether it be a, a trial skill in court or how to handle something athletically, I noticed that my learning style connected up better when it was, I was shown how to do something. It was demonstrated for me. I got to try and fail gloriously, uh, you know, with the folks that were that were sharing it with me. And, and then in sort of a feedback loop, I was given some pointers and, you know, allowed to try and do it again and, and actually work at my own pace and even maybe away from my teacher or coach to get better at it. That's the part that connected with me. And that's, that's the part that I focus on now with people that I coach. And, and what, what do you do? What do you, what are your teaching and coaching? So for me, it's, it's, um, it, it's really, if, if we focus narrowly, I, I'm a law school professor. I was a full-time law school professor before this job, but I, uh, I, I 
I've always had my hand in it. I always continue to teach classes. I imagine that someday I'm going to return to teaching classes just where my heart is. And for, for my students, really what I want to do is I want to teach them to uh, how to listen, how to ask questions, how to construct arguments with actual evidence that's, that's admissible at trial, and, and, and then how to argue and how to react to arguments at, at trial. So that's not really a, a, a finite doctrinal teaching in law school that one would uh, stand on the, the stage in front of class and tell the student. It's more, those are skills and techniques and things that, uh, you know, we can share with students when they're confronted with their own cases and their own matters uh, and their own things to handle. So what I hear you too, saying too is these are almost, I mean, I'm thinking social skills in a way. I, I don't know if it is social skills, but it's, it, you're not just reading the pages in the book. You're actually getting in and practicing and learning how to do something and learning how other people may react and how you should handle a real life situation. Am I, am I seeing that correctly? Is that, is that's that... right. That's right. And you, and if you think about it, if you, if we were trying to do something within a fact pattern, let's say that was a, a criminal law fact pattern, just by the process of us asking the right questions of a witness, trying to get in uh, the pertinent documents that might relate to that case, uh, constructing the argument by bringing together things that come from different witnesses or different pieces of evidence, and then actually standing up and making that argument and reacting to the arguments of others. If you think about it, if the facts of that case happen to be criminal law, you'd be internalizing and, and understanding some of that doctrine just by working on the skill. Matter of fact, you might even learn it better than if it was just said at you uh, and you wrote it down on a piece of paper to then regurgitate it, you know, months later on an exam or God forbid the bar exam even years later. So it's really you're in, encompassing your life skills, your own life skills, I, I suppose, in, into teaching. That's right. Sharing. Is that right? Yeah. That's right. And, yeah. And, and I think it's, you know, that's 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 how we parent. That's how we mentor. That's how we tutor. That's how we mo I mean, anyone that we're sort of interacting with that expresses some openness to learning, which can be very simple, you know, expressing that openness to learning. We can we can enter this dynamic, uh, you know, either at a very very surface level, a, a guest or an uncle or an auntie that's over for dinner, asking a question about them or what they do, shows this openness to learning where you know that that dynamic may take place, or you know, following them on a day to work and asking questions throughout and taking notes and following up. Now that now we've entered a deeper level of sort of being open to learning, but uh, it can you know can take place in a Sort of one episode, but it can also take place over the course of a semester if you get the right, the right coach uh, that's with you, or or being on a team for years. So I, I kind of sense though that I mean not all teachers are going to share this viewpoint uh, that you have. Yours is uh, more life experience as part of teaching, as I see it, and as I hear what you're saying now. Uh, I mean, do you, is there is is there an issue there? Is that a problem? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I don't think it all falls in the teacher, and I don't think it all falls in the coach. I think if we start viewing this as a two-way street for the the learner and the one who is going to give the coach that could uh, you know dispense with some of the learning, it, it's a two-way street. So if the students, if young people start thinking of themselves having an obligation to this, it's my it's my sort of canned response when someone will come from class and say. Oh, we didn't do anything in class today, or or the teacher did X, Y, Z in class today. Well, my my auto response is great. W what did you do to correct that, or what did you do? What questions did you ask to further discussion along? Um, so for you know the more generalized thing, if you took it out of the law school context and those particular students that I have in mind now, if I'm thinking more about whether it's my children or their friends or, or you know even younger learners, I, I talk about it as you, you have to be present first. Then you have to be interested in whatever is being discussed. And then you have to be inquisitive, asking the right questions, asking any questions sometimes with, with these kids. And then how can you connect it up? How can you be assimilative? How can you, how can you actually connect it up to other learning that you have? So if you think about any young person interacting all the ways and all the adults and all the situations that they interact with, uh, part of it, I, I added be present because get off your phone, get your eyes up. Get, be present in a human conversation and a, an interaction because 
you know, if uncle that's over at the table for dinner that night uh, is a fireman, and even if you don't have an interest in being a fireman yourself, you don't have a particular interest in, in, in that life choice, you could be interested in the topic and it might connect up to something else that you know or something else you do have an interest in. So put your phone down, be present, ask questions, and then what can it connect to elsewhere in your life? Okay, and, and you, you, you said your heart is into teaching and, and coaching. And how do you get the students, though? I mean, I mean, I hear you what you're saying, but how do you get them to get their hearts into the same type of thing? Do, do they get rewards, or do, you, or do they understand that, you know, this might result in something positive? Or how, how do you communicate that? This is what I'm asking. Yeah, I think I think at some level it has to be extrin- intrinsic. You have to you have to introduce these topics to them. Um, you have to introduce that the idea that um, the real reward is if you learn to be interested in other people and to ask them questions and to connect it up with other things you learn, uh, you're going to be probably more well liked in more of those interactions. It's probably going to work out for you in job interviews and other interactions that you have with people. In career and business, uh, you know the idea that you're going up to a teacher after class and asking a question that connects up this with something else you learned earlier and asking about that is that's going to be you know favorable for you. So I think it has to be the way I think about it, our educational journey. Sometimes is we all figure it out somewhere along the path. At least most of us figure it out somewhere along the path. And, and it, it's when do you figure out how this really connects up to my you know, my learning as a person on this planet that's going through trying to figure out what they're going to do and how they're going to contribute and how you make it a better place. And so that, and that's part of what you're coaching, I guess, and in, in trying to get across as, as the coach of these life skills and uh, trying to make sure they understand this. And that's part of your coaching, right? That's right. And, and some of these are smuggled, right? I think if you think about the more traditional coaching arrangement if i'm coaching basketball to a bunch of kids yeah i'm going to teach them a a play i'm going to teach them some of their individual skills and what to do and and those they more readily recognize because i'm giving them something that they can put into action the very next practice the very next game that especially if they have some success especially if it connects up and it works they're looking back on the coach like okay now, now i have I knew who you were before, or I knew what kind of resume you gave me, but now that I see that you can share with me something that works, now I'm all ears and now I want to listen more. So I think that's the opportunity, especially for the traditional coach. And I think those of us that have had great coaches in athletics or in theater or music and other parts of our life that are non-academic, we know that once they have our ears like that, once they've shared something with us that works and that we see some progress from, then they can tell us anything about life. Then, then we're 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 ears wide open for what else do they have to offer us that that can work uh, as I'm on my path. And I expect young people to be tunnel vision and to be selfish and to be thinking about themselves. That that's there's a newsflash. That's how we were at those ages too. Um, and I think if you share some of this as to how it can work to their advantage in life, how it can work to their advantage in business how if they they listen to some of these life lessons uh, and, and ways of going about interacting and communicating with others, that it can make their path easier or better or open more doors for them, they're going to be receptive to it. And so it, it really is, you're really teaching them how to live life for the benefit of themselves and the rest of their lives and how they can grow and learn and be successful in life by talking to people, basically, I, that's what I hear you saying. That's the that that's the skill talking and listening um, to people. Now, yep. I want to I want to ask one do, with the, your students: Do they ever come up with any particular question that they ask you during this conversation or during your coaching? Sure, they want to know. Uh, sometimes it's testing to see. You know, what is it about the source? Why, why are you able to give me this information? Why do you have some level of proficiency or expertise? And, you know, w- if we think about it relative to young people, if you're an adult and you're a professional and you've sort of made it so far, you have lots to offer young people. So, the, so anyone that tells me they don't have something to teach or don't have something to coach, if you know how to tie a tie or you've written a professional email in response to someone or you've uh, negotiated a, a promotion situation, whatever it is, 
you've been through it, they have, and you have something to offer. Um, so I think it's, we have to start thinking about these interactions as there's, there's lots to offer, particularly to young people. They're not necessarily going to come at the right time or ask in the right way. But if we show an openness that we're willing to help, and sometimes it's just, hey, I noticed that you're taking, uh, you know, you're going to take that class with that teacher. I, I took that class a long time ago, and I, I really figured out a way to make it work for me. Let me know if you ever want to talk about it. That's an offer that they can take up or not. Uh, but we should be extending those and and giving uh, giving our students and, and giving those who are open to learning, you know, the opportunity to come back and, and and take it if they if they think about it. So you're advocating on both on behalf of teachers and uh, and and the teachers are a wide spectrum of people is what I hear you say. It's, it's everybody if they have something that they can communicate and and give to a student and you're advocating for the students. Hey, participate, be part of it. We, we absolutely think of teachers and coaches too narrowly in our community and in our society. We think it's the person leading English class in sixth grade, that's a teacher. And we think about the person that has the whistle on the soccer field, that's the coach. And if we start thinking about it as, you know, productive adults are all coaches and they all have mentoring and tutoring opportunities with young people, um, you know, it's, it's a matter of opening up those conversations. The negative side of this, of course, is, you know, students are going to emulate and see the demonstrations led by, you know, their parents, all, you know, parents and other adults around them all the time. So if as the parent, you go into the night after school and you have two phones out and you don't look up from them, then the, the kids learn, oh, I guess our, our family interaction is everyone has their heads down in their phones and goes away into their closed doors. Well, that's a learned behavior in a coaching situation too, just not in the not in the way we're talking about, not the way we're advocating for. But if you see the these opportunities to, you know, to coach, to to be there for someone else, and to open up those those avenues, I have authors that I look at that do just that. If you think about it, Mark, your program does that, right? You're learning, showing an openness to learning by having different people on to talk about topics, but then by putting it on YouTube and broadcasting it, you're sharing it, and you pivoting around and being the teacher. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's one of the reasons I think, I think, uh, you know, content creators and podcasts and websites and, and, and YouTube, uh, you know, they're all excellent coaching and teaching mechanisms nowadays that our students and, and young people think of as second nature that quite frankly, we have to stretch to figure out how to use in our daily lives. Well, I like that. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, now, you know, you know, I also noticed that you're uh, on a commission uh, that has been formed about civic debate or interaction. What, what's that about? So the uh, the Supreme Court of the state of Hawaii, like, they, like you know, was done in uh, many of our states uh, across the United States, had, you know, decided to essentially impanel a commission, a statewide commission that would address civic education. It's called PACE, so it's promoting and advancing civic education. There's entities like them, quite frankly, they're some of them are further along, some of them are not off the ground. Ours is, ours is pretty new here in Hawaii, but there's all sorts of efforts that predated it uh, in the space of civics and civics education. Uh, you know, for me and in the context of this conversation, when there's ever a, a collateral duty or something extracurricular that, that dovetails with my job, it happened to be our court, the, the, the federal district court for the District of Hawaii, you know, had one of the seats on this commission. So I knew someone from our court would be on this. So I raised my hand because it was education oriented and because I knew it would be interfacing with young people. Uh, this it's, it's more broad than that. It has to do with civic education generally. So there'll probably be, a, we're gonna have some web, a website, some resources that we link and share, uh, probably content created that's, that's gonna come from our students. But as you might imagine, and consistent with our conversation here, uh, one of the first things we did is figured out what type of program could we even the commission, we don't really have any resources or employees or, or anything yet other than the, the, the commissioners that are in the room. But we designed a program for high schoolers. We did it, um, we started on a neighbor island, we started in Maui, um, and we did sort of a, a mock trial civics problem program that was over a couple of days of their spring break and had students from all over, including uh, Molokai and Lanai, and, uh, and, 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 came, and came to a program for a couple of days over their breaks where we taught skills and questioning and, and constructing arguments. So I figured if I'm gonna be on this commission, I'm gonna do something in my wheelhouse and try to share it with students. 
And then, uh, okay, and that, yeah, that does sound like something that you would uh, have promoted. Uh, what uh, I mean, what does civic debate mean? I mean, is it? I mean, we're having trouble. Let's be frank. In our country, there's problems uh, uh, with talking to one another. Sometimes, is that what this is about? I, yeah, I think it can address that for sure. I mean, I, I think my passion. If if I share with someone at a dinner party my passion for civics education, it's because uh, I'm I'm trying to stop the landslide a little bit that happens. Uh, you know, in 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 our public arena and and on a nationwide scale. And I think part of it comes from, you know, how are we doing with uh, with listening to those on the other side of a debate? How are we doing with actually asking the right questions of not only the people on the other side of the debate, but people who are experts and who would purportedly, you know, offer information uh, to the topics covered by that debate? Um, it seems to turn into a lot of cable news, cable, you know, talk radio, where it's just who can, Yell louder or score a point that's uh, that's clippable to go on the internet, um, it, it, and 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 it happens with our elected officials. It happens at every level, and it's demonstrated at every level. So I think the idea that I, I'm still a huge proponent that that legal training adds something to that if if done the right way. If you learn how to ask the right questions and actually marshal evidence to make real arguments, then you're going to be you're going to be honest and 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 adhere to those arguments as opposed to straying or yelling louder or, or just using ad hominem attacks. Um, and it also causes you to, uh, I always share with my, my law students that I, I used to listen to, to talk radio on the ideolo ideologically other side of where I sat because I wanted to hear what they were saying. I wanted to listen to it and I wanted to see if I, you know, how many of the, the, the counter arguments that I have at the ready and how many would I have to sort of go out and find evidence to disprove. So, you know, if you think about it like that, we can actually improve the level of argument and, and improve the way our young people go about civil discourse and therefore their, you know, their, you know, their civic engagement. Well, you know, and I like what you said about law education also, and I, I feel the same way. And that is that uh, a, a good legal education, I think will allow you to see both sides of an argument and realize that there are two sides of an argument and that you present your side and you know the, the, a judge may make a decision and that that's how civic discussion progresses and and you know you 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 have to put forward your own feelings truly and that's i think a good 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 idea about law education yeah i from your point of view, I see, is, is that correct? Is that what I'm seeing? Yeah, and, and if you think about it, sometimes we, we, we stray away from it in legal education. You know, I, I worry about that. I, I don't think every class has to be purely Socratic, and I certainly don't think that learning through fear or humiliation is all, always productive. But I do think participation, interaction, argument, and counter-argument are foundational to any legal class. So I do, I do teach doctrinal classes. I teach criminal law, criminal procedure, and, and my real passion in the legal arena is, is evidence. I teach the rules of evidence. I teach it as, you know, make the argument for, and, and you'll never hear me say plaintiff or defendant or prosecutor or defense attorney. I talk about proponent and opponent. Who's the one putting on this evidence and what arguments are they going to make for the admission of this evidence? And who's the one that's in our legal system charged with getting in the way through objection uh, as the opponent. And so how do those discussions go? And what's the best possible argument you could make for either side, knowing that it very well could come, you know, up here to the bench and uh, be a coin flip. It's just a matter of, well, how can we put ourselves in the best position uh, to make evidentiary arguments? But that training, that skill of making arguments and having a body of rules where you make arguments from those rules based on prior, you know, prior application of the rules, prior cases, uh, that type of thing, I, I think is vitally important. And our, our big our big problem with cable TV and talk radio is there there is no court, there is no judge, nobody's called out. Um, but I think if, this, if the training's the same, uh, you know, you don't find a lot of practicing lawyers on those shows just yelling at the top of their lungs, you know, without having some evidence to support their positions. Yeah, and I like what you said about evidence uh, training and you're, I, 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 I see that. I see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Teaching evidence is like teaching how to have a civil, civic argument or discussion. 
Um, I, I want to ask you now, as we're getting close to the end of our talk here, we, with respect to your students, um, you know, some of them are going to look at the future with some uncertainty. Some of them will be depressed. How, how, what, as a teacher, coach of students, what do you tell them? How do they, what do you, what advice do you give them to get through these immediate issues they're dealing with and the social media that you talked about, that people arguing and the things that you see on the news, how, what do you tell them? Well, one, I think always on some level, we have to, we have to, we have to coach folks to know that they can only control the things they can control. So the idea of worrying about everything that's outside of their control, it, you know, can, can be too much and can be overwhelming. It can be overwhelming for any one of us. But what's the, what are the parts that you can control? What are the parts that you have ownership and stewardship of? And then what could you do about them? If we start to explain to our students, as opposed to everything's on a, on a landslide, it's all, it's all worse than it was when we grew up, uh, good luck with all that. Of course, they're going to have some of those feelings. If we start telling them that, you know, their educational pathway and the tools that they have available, they're more equipped for complex problem solving than any other generation that it's ever been. If you think about just something as simple as the past three years with the pandemic, if that had happened when I was in ninth grade, as opposed to my son being in ninth grade, that just would have been a long time out of school. And, and the same thing if it happened decades earlier, um, who knows how long we would have ever got back to a traditional classroom. So the idea that because of technology and because of group problem solving that this generation, and you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a bunch, a bunch of folks that uh, are my age and above. It was involving lots of people in government and in tech to say, nope, we can pivot to remote learning like that and keep kids on a path and actually get creative about how they can, they can handle things. Also in, in education nowadays, they work in teams and in groups far more often than we ever did on our educational path. And guess what, you know, to, to go through complex problem solving that the world's handing us now, you have to learn how to work with different people on different size groups and to have different level check-ins, to have individual responsibility for long-term planning and long-term goal setting. Uh, you know, they're equipped to be on these ready-made teams to handle one task and then to quickly move on and go to another one. Uh, and it's probably why you know, they're less likely to be in, in the one job of decades ago and just stay in that job and have an employer and have a paycheck for the whole time. They're going to have opportunities and be part of sort of a gig economy where they may just have a service to offer as an individual where they assimilate and become part of these teams and consult on different problems and, and, and really find themselves having to be additive to whatever the issue is of the day. So for me, it's like, you're right in the middle as a young person right now, you're right in the middle of the generation and the cusp of advanced problem solving at a level we've never seen and problems that we couldn't have anticipated um, and problem solving at a level, they connect up faster than we ever did. Uh, they're able to marshal resources faster than we've ever did. They're able to share their learning uh, through technology faster than we've ever done. So uh, if, if we think about it, how well they're armed for this, and you couple that with the conversation that we've been having about asking the right questions, uh, assimilating what they're learning, really listening, and working on some of those computer skills, they could be better equipped to, than anyone for a future generation. And, and actually, what you just said gave me a lot of hope, this, this older fella, uh, because what you're saying is there's, there, yeah, there's more assets to this younger younger generation and yes they're facing maybe bigger problems but they've overcome some of them in, in covid like you said t teaching went on even though they weren't at school so yeah well that's gosh that makes me feel better uh and and uh, that there is some there is some hope possibly and that there are advantages that exist in this younger generation now i want to at ask you, we're right at the end of our program here. Um, what, I mean, is, is there something about Hawaii and the life and culture in Hawaii that uh, you teach or that you add to your discussion uh, when you are coaching students on life skills? There is, uh, because it, it goes back to that, the, the, the point that we discussed earlier about it sort of being a two-way street. And I think any of us that are 
older generation dealing with younger generation, we know, okay, there's, there's things that we can share, things that we can impart, especially at ask. But we also know when it comes to, you know, uh, setting the TV or getting a program on or doing something technological in the house that we're going to ask the younger people for their advice and their coaching on how best to do that. So, you know, we, we have to recognize that the openness to learning is really a two-way street and that, that works uh, in our culture here in Hawaii culture because we, you know, we have the concept of uh, ohana and how we, and how we sit down and how we have mutual respect for everyone in the family from the youngest to the oldest. And so I think if we, think of those same times when we gather uh, as Ohana, as family, and we go back and forth and, and different people have, have the mic and they're talking about different things that go on, we give equal audience and we give equal attention to the seventh grader in the family and, and the question that's posed to them as we do to the kapuna in the family. And so it's, it's ripe for that two-way learning and it's ripe for that uh, coaching that can go in all directions. So I, I think, I think culturally, like on many issues, uh, we're gonna we're gonna be ahead of it as as soon as we recognize that there's not only a learner in every room, but there's a coach in every room. Wow. Well, look. Uh, thank you. I like that uh, that explanation. That's really cool, and that's really good. It really hits the point. And thank you, Wes Porter, for teaching and coaching me today. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to meet and talk with you. And thank you. Aloha.